some 40,000 aeronautical artifacts in all. The triumphs and failures of our high-flying past. It's a fantastic clutter of every conceivable kind of airplane and spacecraft and spare part and what to the uninitiated may look like a lot of junk. But these are really icons, these relics. They're the technological marvels that shape the history of our century. Now they're still, silent. Some are in disrepair, others as bright and shiny as the day they were made. There are ideas that barely got off the ground, like the J.V. Martin Kitten, a tiny plane that never climbed higher than four feet. It does stake a claim in history as the first plane with retractable landing gear. Far out ideas like a real flying saucer, tested and abandoned by the Air Force. And record-breaking ideas like this F-4 Phantom, nicknamed Sage Bear. It set a low altitude record, flying just 125 feet off the ground at 900 miles an hour, faster than the speed of sound. The collection ranges from advanced space age designs to the earliest days of flight. This is a turn of the century attempt at a man carrying flying machine called the Langley Aerodrome, a curiosity with a special Smithsonian connection. Samuel P. Langley, the institution's third secretary, had it built in a workshop behind the Smithsonian Castle in 1903. A small model was a success, and Langley was certain a full-scale version that could carry a person would work just as well. For the first time, man would fly. Mounted on a houseboat in the middle of the Potomac River, a catapult launched the aerodrome. It plopped into the water like a handful of mortar, the Washington Post reported. Langley tried again two months later. The pilot barely escaped drowning. Just nine days later, Wilbur and Orville Wright succeeded where Langley had failed. Man could fly. Langley, scorned by the public and ridiculed by the press, died two years later, his spirit broken. History is reflected in every artifact at Silver Hill. They're tangible testaments to the important events of our century. But many of them are in an advanced state of decay. The main task here is restoration. The work is performed with such artistry and meticulous attention to detail, an average of only four planes can be completed in a year. The first step in any renovation is the complete disassembly of the airplane. Every step and every piece is photographed, not only for the archives, but to ensure that what's been taken apart can be put together again. The metal parts of an aircraft are treated for corrosion. Damaged pieces are repaired. Those beyond help or missing are replaced with duplicates made to order at Silver Hill. Even without the original plans or instruction manuals, these craftsmen can make a part so perfect, each is stamped so future historians and plane buffs won't mistake them for the originals. The desire for accuracy goes all the way to the paint job. Careful study determines the colors and markings most significant for each aircraft. All right, let's go that way. Even hand-painted instructions are carefully reproduced. This biplane has been reduced to a state of seemingly hopeless dilapidation by an accident and years of storage. The Wiseman Cook, built in 1910, was the first plane to carry official airmail. From Petaluma to Santa Rosa, California, a grand total of 15 miles. The plane was constructed with enormous ingenuity. The pilot's seat came from a John Deere tractor. The clever designers came up with a special button to keep the pilot alive. Okay, what this is called is dead man switch. You had to keep pressure on this at all times. If the pilot were to fall out of the airplane on a rough landing, 
he would let go of this button, and this would kill the engine. So the airplane wouldn't run over him. I have to be really pretty careful taking this off, because I think it's going to try and disintegrate on us if we hang Rich it. Horrigan and Carl Heinzel are removing the Wiseman Cook's worn, varnished yeah. cloth wing covers. What kind of protection is that? What we do is we measure the seams, the distance, the type of stitching, the type of fabric, and then we very carefully remove it from the airplane and fold it up and keep it in the collection for uh, future generations. Only 2% of the Wiseman Cook's parts will have to be replaced. They even try to save the string that ties the covers to the wings. I don't know. It's rotten. Now, the reason I'm taking you The finished product, the looking office, like new, will be put on display in the makeshift warehouse museums of Silver Hill. The public is invited. Tours by appointment. Mary Fike, another restoration expert, is one of Silver Hill's most popular guides. This particular case is covered with rubber. My first experience with an airplane was when I was seven years old. There was an old barnstorming jenny that came down and landed in a field near our house. And a seven-year-old looking at an airplane would be comparable to a seven-year-old today looking up in the sky and seeing a UFO. It was something that you never, ever expected to see. Never. And when you did see it, believe me, it made an impression. Jenny, the affectionate nickname of the Curtis JN4. In the 1920s, barnstormers flew them around the country, performing stunts and charging the locals for a ride in the sky. There were no rules and regulations about how you had to maintain them. There were no rules and regulations about being licensed, so people could buy them and could learn to fly and take up passengers on their very second flight after, uh, after soloing. When America entered World War I in 1917, it was the Jenny that taught thousands of our aviation cadets how to fly. As simple as the Model T, forgiving to the raw recruit at the throttle, sturdy enough that a rookie could often walk away from a crash. Daring young men who began training in Jennies dreamt of becoming aces. With as little as 15 hours flying time, they rushed off to Europe, combat, and a life expectancy of less than three weeks. The planes they flew in battle are now part of our history. This is a real classic, a SPAD 13, the rugged French-built biplane that became one of the most famous fighters of World War I. Some of the most dashing and heroic names of the whole war are associated with spads. Eddie Rickenbacker, the Lafayette Escadrille, the Dawn Patrol. This one was flown by a young American lieutenant named Arthur Brooks. He went through three other spads before this, naming each one after his fiancee's alma mater, Smith College. This is Smith IV. Lieutenant Brooks downed six enemy planes the last of them in this aircraft. I was surrounded, and uh, uh, that isn't a very good feeling. Uh, you didn't have time to do anything except to have every second to twist your head, uh, as I figure a chicken does, uh, any way that you can imagine, because uh, you couldn't afford to be without knowledge as to where there was something coming from any angle, any height, or whatever. The plane flew 50 hours over the Verdun front during one of the most horrible battles of the entire war. You see this German cross? It marks a bullet hole. And there are 63 others like it in the plane. The fabric is cotton and too far gone to be restored. The wonder is that it's lasted as long as it has. But after restoration, the artists who work here at Silver Hill will have duplicated everything, bullet holes and all, including the three that hit the windshield right there, only inches from the face of Lieutenant Brooks. And I expected to die. It's simple as that. What are you going to do about it? Uh, I wasn't there just to play around, and I wasn't there to uh, dog rob or anything else. I was there to uh, do what I could for the United States of America.
Brooks was one of the lucky ones. War, for all its horror, usually advances technology. Engineers build on what they had learned during World War I and came up with better and better designs. Giuseppe Balanca, one of the world's top designers, created the elegant Balanca CF in 1922. It was the first successful single-wing plane with an enclosed cabin for the passengers. The fearless pilot remained out in the open, taking the wind full in the face. Five years later, in 1927, America had a new hero, and Charles Lindbergh soloed across the Atlantic. Over the next decade, record-breaking flights would become a national craze. In Meridian, Mississippi, in 1935, the Key brothers, Fred and Al Jean, thought up a stunt to help drum up business for their new airport. Flying their Curtis Robin airplane, they would stay in the air longer than anyone ever had before. Gasoline had to be funneled down a handheld hose. Food was delivered the same way, prepared by a Meridian Ladies Auxiliary. Twice a day, the engine had to be lubricated, so one of the two brothers had to climb around the front of the plane on a specially designed catwalk. After 653 hours and 34 minutes, that's more than 27 days in the air, their plane, Ole Miss, finally landed. They held this amazing record until 1980. The Key Brothers gave Ole Miss to the Smithsonian in 1955. It was kept in its prime at Silver Hill and transferred to the Air and Space Museum on the Mall in Washington. In 1941, with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, America was again at war. During World War II, air power would be decisive. Just eight hours after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese struck again. This time, Clark Field, the American air base in the Philippines. Not one plane was left intact. But from the wreckage, repair crews were able to mix and match enough pieces to put together a handful of flyable B-17 bombers to carry on the war. Swoos was one of them, nicknamed after a popular song about a bird that was half swan and half goose. It's a fitting name for a plane that's a combination of different parts, but sturdy enough to fly missions across the entire Pacific. In all, the Swoos logged 4,000 hours of flight time. Fading away now are the names and flags of all the nations visited by the Swoos and the signatures of the men who flew her, painted or scratched on the fuselage. The Swoos is the last of its kind, the oldest remaining B-17 in the world. At the beginning of the war, the B-17, the Flying Fortress, was the most advanced plane in the American arsenal. By the end of the war, this plane, the B-29, held that distinction. And this is the most historic B-29 of them all. This is the Enola Gay, the plane that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. To build the B-29 and the atomic bomb were the top technological priorities of the entire American war effort. They came together on an August day in 1945 when this plane flew its mission. The Enola Gay is here at Silver Hill in storage, an eerie reminder of the beginning of our nuclear age. Preserving objects like the Enola Gay forces us to confront history head on, and so do the planes of former enemies. 
there's a lot of lessons to be learned from things that happen like that. Preserving the technology of the time is probably one of the most important things. For three years, Mike Lyons and Joe Fischera have been working on the Falk Wolf 190, a German fighter considered one of the finest combat aircraft ever made. Okay, how's your gun barrel doing? Thousands of hours have been spent hand sanding through layers of paint, tracking down missing parts, reconstructing the plane as it was in World War II. You feel proud of the fact that you are here working on this some 40 years after the event actually happened and able to retrieve a little bit of history by uh, reassembling the airplane the way it looked in 1944. Only one thing could top the satisfaction that comes from the completion of a perfect job. It would be a thrill of a lifetime to be able to fly something like this. Just one time, that's all, just once. The Falk Wolf is Silver Hill's latest masterpiece of restoration. Just as if it were a brand new aircraft, there's an official ceremony, a rollout. Friends, colleagues, and other aviation devotees come to take a look. Paul Garber fought to make the air and space collections a part of the Smithsonian. He takes special delight in the work at Silver Hill. You can feel the emanation of life in these aircraft once they're brought back to reality, as we do here in the shop. But we have such very fine artisans here. They're far more than mechanics. They're artists in metal, as well as in wood and fabric. We do get a perfect job. Nothing else would do. That's our standard. You have to have that. So as I see each one come out, it's like a, like a rebirth. <laughs> Whether they've been completely reborn or remain in pieces on the ground, they still conjure memories of bravery, brilliance, and they still give flight to a thousand dreams. Port Oregon, Monday at 7.30. Channel 8, your Rose Festival station, celebrates the Northwest with the following special presentation.